today on the Sunday. It's a privilege to speak um, here, and thank you for you know taking a taking a chance on me as it's my first position, um, official position. So um, I'll get into the I'll get into the word. So um, let me ask you: How many of you have? questions what questioned what you have believed as a Christian like raise your hand if you like questioned your faith before I definitely have and so I imagine that you also have had had doubts as a Christian right so I think can you is there any way that you can turn me down a little bit <laughs> it's really loud okay that's a little bit that's better um if you guys haven't figured out what I'm talking about this morning, it's I'm, I'm talking about questioning and doubting, um, you know, questioning God and having doubts as a Christian. Um, and having questions is a normal part of spiritual development and finding out the why behind, you know, the what we believe. And it's definitely okay to question God. Um, you know, in, in the Bible, we see people questioning God. For instance, Job was blameless and upright and he respected God uh, which means fear and but his all of his animals were killed his sons and daughters died his servants died and he questions God on why he was even born in the first place um, and then the at the end of the book of Job um, it teaches us to trust God in every circumstance that he has he knows what he's doing essentially um, another one would be Abraham and Sarah um, Abraham, one of the most faith-filled people in the Old Testament, um, questioned God whether he was going to, you know, if God was going to deliver a child at 100 years old. And then on the contrary, we have to be careful while questioning God because Adam and Eve questioned God and it led to disobedience. So two instances of questioning God led to strengthening of faith, but one led to disobedience and sin. So God question states that when we question God, our attitudes should reflect a humble spirit, trusting heart, and an open mind. We can question the Lord, but we should not expect to receive an answer unless we truly believe in Him and accept His sovereign perspective. So if we earnestly if we are earnestly seeking an answer from God, it is not wrong to question Him. But if our heart is untrusting or bitter, um, you know, that is a result of our heart producing unbelief, and then which can lead to sin and which we should not do at that point. Uh, questioning is also related to doubt. Doubt is defined as the uncertainty of belief or opinion. You know, it's like, it's, it's funny because as a Christian, it's, doubt is almost like a bad word. We're not supposed to doubt God, like doubt what God's going to do. Like, it's like, if you doubt, you don't actually believe in him changing circumstances. But the thing is, is that doubt is completely normal as a Christian. I know I definitely have doubted, but the thing is with doubt is we have to deal with it. Like, we can't let it fester. Uh, we need to share it with another believer so they can encourage us, or we need to give it to God, like in Mark 29, or sorry, Mark verse, Mark 9, verse 24, there you go, states that the father instantly cried out, I do believe, but help me overcome my unbelief. And this is the father who had a um, son that was, that had a demon in him for a long time, and the disciples couldn't get it out. Um, and so, he talks to Jesus and, you know, he's like, help me overcome my belief, uh, unbelief, sorry. Um, and the thing is, is that God will help us overcome our issue, but if we let it go unaddressed, then it becomes a problem. Um, Ed Jarrett from Christianity, Christianity Today states that indeed doubt can be destructive if we do not deal with it. Hiding or suppressing doubt can leave it to fester and eventually explode into unbelief. But doubt can also be very productive, uh, a very productive experience if addressed properly. Doubt can help me grow in my faith and understanding, in my understanding of that faith. So the thing is about doubt is we can choose to grow from it or we can let it destroy us. 
Um, in my 20s, I questioned what I grew, uh, what I grew up believing because I was fortunate enough to grow up uh, in the church, and this was a part of me trying to figure out my own beliefs and have my own relationship with God. So I started questioning what you know I believed, and luckily for me, I had three gracious pastors that helped me through this, and not everyone has that, but um, I don't think I would be where I am today without them. Um, and unfortunately, when we don't have anyone to help us through this process, it can lead to deconstruction of faith, if you have ever heard that, um, if it's left unchecked. So um, deconstruction, um, or unfortunately, questioning and doubting can left, left unchecked can cause deconstruction. So deconstruction is um, the process of uh, questioning and ultimately rejecting aspects of Christian faith. In practice, though, deconstruction acts all, um, almost always as a polite cover of demolition or modern destruction usually means replacing uncomfortable tenets with culturally or per, uh, personally popular ideas. Um, so what that means is that you grow up with, the, with these ideas of the Christian church and then you, when you start questioning it, you don't know if you believe in that, and then you completely reject what you had grow, grown up and learned. Um, and this is increasingly popular trend. Um, I have found myself on deconstruction TikTok, and so there's a lot of um, people who used to be uh, religious, and most of this comes from Mormon or Jehovah's Witness backgrounds. But you can also find this in evangelical Christian circles, um, like ourselves. And that is not good. <laughs> uh, but, and the thing is, is that scripture leaves room for us to examine our faith. Uh, fact checking in Acts 17, it's up on this screen. Um, the father, oh, sorry, um, and the people of uh, Berea were open minded than those in. Thessalonica, and they listened eagerly to Paul's message. They searched the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. So we can fact check. The next one is being skeptical in John, uh, sorry, 1 John 4, 1. And it says, dear friends, do not believe everyone who claims to speak by the Spirit. You must test them to see, uh, to see if the Spirit they have comes from God, for there are many false prophets in the world. And lastly, crying, crying out with complaints in Habakkuk 1, 2 through 4. And it says, how long, O Lord, must I call out or cry or call for help, but you do not listen? Violence is everywhere. I cry, but you do not come to save. Must I forever see these evil deeds? Why must I watch all this misery? Wherever I look, I see destruction and violence. I am surrounded by those who love to argue and fight. The law has become paralyzed, and there is no justice in the courts. The wicked far, out, uh, far outnumber the righteous, so that justice has, been, uh, has become perverted. And so, while the Bible allows for this, God questions states that stating all this must be within reason. And modern deconstruction does not allow for that. Uh, allow that. Um, and... If scripture leaves room for these things that we can, you know, share, we can cry out to the Lord and uh, with complaints, we can be skeptical and we can, you know, examine our faith and back checking um, things because you know that not everything on the internet is true or not everything you hear is, you know, true, but if that's the case, if scripture leaves room, these churches, uh, the church, us, and Big C Church, everybody, um, should allow it as well. And unfortunately, this is not the case because the people who are struggling with questioning or doubt are often labeled as troublemakers or unbelievers. But they're just struggling. And there's nothing wrong with struggling.
And when we make them into something that they're not, it only adds fuel to the fire. It adds momentum to this movement that is changing people who are my age and younger. Um, people, uh, those who are de deconstructing are sometimes choosing an easier view or adopting views in which the world seems uh, deems acceptable. Um, and that, that is like the most basic way that I can put deconstruction. Uh, there is a reasonable, a reasonably popular TikToker who makes fun of Christian, uh, Christian churches, and that is like the content they make. And I follow some of those accounts, but um, I follow those who are actual Christians. And they, I, well, I showed Alicia a couple, and um, he was just making fun of like the stereotypical. Um, guy that is hitting on the, you know, the cute um, single woman in the church. But um, <laughs> um, this particular couple, this woman is married to someone who came out as trans recently. Um, and they used to be church leaders. But the, the thing that always comes, I'm not, I'm not judging them for the way that they choose to live because that's not what we're called for, but called to do. But the, the thing that is coming into my mind is her profile bio used to say recovering from religious trauma. And the thing that I think is, are you recovering from religious trauma or did you start questioning your faith? You got hurt and nobody was there to help you through this process. And you found acceptance in a community um, or you found acceptance and community and you adopted views of the world. And I'm not downplaying the religious trauma because it is very real. But the thing is, is you can question your beliefs. You can have doubt, but we have to do it healthy. And it has to be done in a willingness to be corrected and to learn when God, if you're earnestly seeking a answer from God. And it needs to be in moderation. So church, instead of ignoring and calling people troublemakers, you know, we're going to look at how Jesus dealt with unbelief and doubt when Thomas was skeptical about Jesus coming back from the dead. You know, I would be skeptical about that too. Like, I would want to, like, you know, touch him. But, um, uh, and it's like, it's almost like you died. Like, I, I saw you die. <laughs> like, how are you back? And so that must have been, like, mind-blowing. But... Um, if you want to turn to John 20, um, verses 24 through 29, um, that is the text that we are going to be looking at. And we're going to run a little short today, but that's okay. Um, <laughs> uh, so verse 24. Now Thomas was one of the twelve, called the twin, uh, was not with them when Jesus came. So the, others disciple, the other disciples told him, We have seen the Lord. But he said to them, Unless I see the hands, or unless I see in his hands the mark of the nails, and place my finger onto the mark of the nails, and I place my hand onto his side, I will never believe. And so it doesn't mention why Thomas wasn't with them when uh, Jesus came, but. You know, he had credible witnesses. He had, he, he had credible witnesses as the other disciples. Um, and we know that they're credible, you know, because, you know, they were the people that were preaching uh, the word back in the day. But, um, and so it's strange to see that Thomas doesn't believe the people that he was with 24-7, like seven days a week, um, every day, every minute. But the thing is, is that he wanted proof, touch, he wanted to, he wanted proof that he could touch, see, and feel. And, you know, and I, I don't blame him, and I already said that, but, um, you know, I would want to have proof that that was actually Jesus. But, um, and in here we see that he just flat out refuses to believe. And I actually think that would be better than if he pretended um, that he believed when he actually did die. And David Guzik says that it was good that he outright refused and did not pretend to believe when he actually did not. 
Um, and it's funny because when you when you look at this text and with Thomas, like he doesn't doubt, but he just outright refuses. So doubting Thomas isn't really a good way to um, isn't a good way to describe him, but he it's almost like he didn't actually believe it was Jesus coming back. And, um, and then verse 26, we'll continue. Um, verse 26 says, Eight days later, his disciples were inside again, and Thomas was with them. Although the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here and see my hands, and put out your hand and place it, on, place it in my side. Do not disbelieve, but believe. And so in verses 26 and 27, we see that Jesus, instead of reprimanding Thomas for having unbelief, he corrects him. And, you know, Jesus could have demanded faith from Thomas, but it wouldn't have been genuine because he already flat out refused before. And then Jesus offers Thomas what he had been searching for to remedy his unbelief. And so it's just, it, 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 it just uh, makes me think that it's, we really see the character of Jesus because Jesus could have been like, oh, Thomas, you need to stop. Or he tells him to, to stop on his unbelief. But, um, but Jesus didn't have to prove anything to Thomas, but he did anyway. Um, and, you know, Thomas helped him, or Jesus helped Thomas through his unbelief when Jesus could have just walked away and been like, sorry, Thomas, I'm here, like, believe in me, or don't, like, I don't care, but, um, moving on to verse 28, uh, Thomas answered him, my Lord, my God, uh, my Lord and my God, Jesus said to him, have you believed because you have seen me, blessed are those who have not and yet have believed. Um, so in verses 28 and 29, we see that Thomas makes an immediate transition of thought because of the mercy and grace and love that was shown by Jesus. Um, in modern terms, Thomas literally had a come to Jesus moment. And this is the way that we should reflect those who we should reflect Christ in those who are struggling as we need to meet them with grace and mercy and love. And if we know that someone is struggling, we must help them and we should not let them fall by the wayside. We should not label them as troublemakers or unbelievers. We are as Christians, as the body of Christ, we are called to help bear their burden. And uh, more recently, um, I, can, I can attest to this. When we first moved, um, I had gotten a job at um, the preschool uh, in Boardman, and I was substituting, a substitute teaching in a preschool classroom. And Courtney and I were only living off of what I was making as a substitute teacher. And let me tell you, that sucked <laughs> because... Uh, we had like $15 and before our next payday, and we had to pay our phone bill, but we gave it to tithe anyway. Um, and so um, we thought that was best, but the thing that I'm getting at is um, the, te the two teachers there in the classroom that I was in, they're like, you should quit your job at the church and work for Amazon. And... Um, and that stuck with me. That Those words stuck with me. Quit your job, work at Amazon, your money troubles will be over. But that would have caused me to sell my soul for money and quit the job that I actually like doing better than subbing. But, um, and that, that stuck with me for a while, didn't it, Courtney? If I should quit my job and work at Amazon. <laughs> but... Yeah. 
Yeah, um, but the thing is, is that they didn't understand why I would do a job for as little as I make. Um, and I'm not, I'm not saying that I don't make enough, but, um, and, but the thing is, is that I didn't doubt that God could work in the midst of my issue, but I was putting my faith in myself rather than God to get me out of this hole. It was more of a me misplacing my faith um, and doubting that we would ever get out of this hole. And Courtney and I prayed almost every night for God to bless us um, financially. And by his grace, graciously, he had people in the church just give us money. I'm not going to name anyone, but they would just give us a card and say, we're here to bless you. Here you go. Here's $100, $200 or whatever. And it was enough. And, you know, he blessed my family with Courtney um, getting a job at Windy River. Um, I get a stipend, but, um, and I also sub more often. But um, he allowed us to stay here longer. And, and by the grace of God, you know, I put my faith back in him. And now I put my faith in him all the time. And um, the thing is, is that, like, I went to other pastors and be like, hey, I'm struggling with this. Like, I went to Pastor Darren and I said, hey, I'm struggling with this. Like, help me. Like, please help me with my unbelief. And if you are struggling with unbelief, give it to God. If you are struggling with doubt, share it with a trusted friend, like somebody who you trust. Um, if you have questions about anything, ask your pastor. Like, you can ask me, you can ask Pastor Darren. Um, and just don't let your questioning turn to doubt, and don't become bitter and let it consume you. Grow from it, become stronger in your faith because of it. And then the best part is, now that you are a witness of God's grace, and you can witness what God can do in that, and you can share it with somebody else who is struggling that way. Uh, but this is also a two-way street. If you know someone who's struggling, help them, encourage them, love them, just as Jesus did to Thomas when he was doubting. Um, and this is like, and this is something that was put on my heart because I have known people that are my age that grew up in the church who no longer believe. And because they, and the main part of it was they only saw what they knew was rules and regulations and religion, not Jesus loves you, God loves you, this is why we do it. Um, questioning is healthy, you will have doubts. Being a Christian is not easy. It's not an easy road. God didn't say your life will be easy as a Christian, but it's easier with God. Am I right? Yeah. And so, and I see this with our students and, um, and people in college, young adults, and it just reminds me of how I had people who are gracious to come and help me through this time because I, I, can, I can say I would not be here. I don't know where I would be, but I would not be here. I wouldn't be a pastor. Um, but if you are struggling, please let somebody know. If you have questions, please let somebody know. And if, I, if you ask me and I don't have the answer, I will find out and we will learn together. I promise. I will tell you that I don't know, but we will find out. So um, if you would bow your heads and close your eyes. I will close and I will get you out of here for lunch. Um, God, I just ask that you encourage them in their, if anyone this, in this congregation that is struggling with doubt or you know has questions, God, that they would feel led by you to let somebody know, God, that in their midst of reading that you would reveal them who you are and what you can do, God just like you did for me, just like you did for Thomas, just like you did for Abraham. And know that you are delighted when they want to know more 
um, about your plans for them, that you want to, you let them know that you want to help them learn, that you want to give them what they need to keep going, God. And I just ask that you bless everyone in this uh, room today and that you strengthen them and just encourage them to let somebody know. In Jesus' name, amen. Let the Lord, may the Lord keep you and bless you and may his face shine upon you.